Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. This summer, millions of Catholic teenagers and young adults will travel from around the world to attend World Youth Day, an event established by Pope John Paul II and carried forward by Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI. An international pilgrimage of continued conversion, catechesis, friendship, music, culture, and art, World Youth Day is a meeting of hearts driven by the same faith. But how did Christianity go from a small group of apostles to the largest community of believers on earth today? Go proclaim the hope that only comes from Christ's uh, resurrection. And he gave this uh, cross to us by saying, bring this cross to every place where people are suffering or are in any kind of need. Basically, our main, main mission is uh, to help young people to encounter Christ. At the end of uh, the Second Vatican Council, uh, Pope uh, Paul VI gave a very strong message to the young people, explaining they are the new responsible of evangelization in the Church. In the 1960s, the bishops of the Second Vatican Council sought to address, in a refreshing and renewed way, Christ's call to make disciples of all nations. But how would the discussions of the Council impact the face of missionary work? We are part of a global family of faith. Uh, and, and of course, it took us a while to get there, but I mean, the reality of Catholicism today is that two-thirds of the 1.2 billion Catholics in the world live in the Southern Hemisphere. Projection is by 2050, that's going to be three quarters. I mean, we are in reality a global church, and it's Vatican II that opened the pathways for us to begin thinking through what that means. Join us as we meet with historians and theologians, eyewitnesses and experts to investigate the meaning of Vatican II and uncover the event which would become a definitive landmark in the history of the modern Catholic Church. Pentecost. Christ breathes his word over the disciples in the upper room, invoking the Holy Spirit and conferring their mission. Nearly 2,000 years later, the bishops of Vatican II would center their focus on this historical event, reminding the faithful that all are commissioned by Christ, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, to share the good news of the resurrection. Called to work together in unison, the people of God spread the gospel of Christ. Come il Padre ha mandato me, anche io mando voi. Così disse il risorto ai discepoli e soffiando su di loro aggiunse, ricevete lo Spirito Santo. E Dio, il principale soggetto dell'evangelizzazione del mondo, mediante Gesù Cristo, ma Cristo stesso ha voluto trasmettere alla Chiesa la propria missione e lo ha fatto e continua a farlo sino alla fine dei tempi infondendo lo Spirito Santo nei discepoli. This mission is rooted in the mystery of the Incarnation. God came in human time, in human form, as Christ to reconcile the world to himself and to pour out his salvific grace. Therefore, in following Christ, the faithful are called to continue his mission. But what does this mission entail exactly? The Council Fathers defined mission as building up the church among those who do not yet know or believe in Christ. In a sense, following Christ's call, planting seeds of faith and becoming fishers of men. In his apostolic letter, Porta Fidei, Pope Emeritus, Benedict XVI, has declared this year the year of faith for an authentic and renewed conversion to the Lord, the one Savior of the world. Well, I think the year of faith is tied into the new evangelization. Uh, I think we recognize that we in our own community need to be evangelized and uh, nations and continents that have not heard of Christ have to be evangelized as well. Now, it has to start with us. It has to start with committed Christians and committed Catholics. And, uh, that will be the proof as to whether the year of faith and the new evangelization is successful. 
Uh, do we find more people taking interest in the sacraments, making use of the sacrament of penance, uh, supporting Catholic education and, and seeing that Catholic education is also Catholic formation for the young people? Deeply rooted in the themes of the Second Vatican Council, the missionary spirit of the Year of Faith seeks to ignite a revival in dioceses, parishes, and individual lives. And the church is there to serve and, and not, to, uh, uh, not to impose, but to propose. Durante il Concilio vi era una tensione commovente nei confronti del comune compito di far risplendere la verità e la bellezza della fede nell'occhio del nostro tempo senza sacrificarla alle esigenze del presente né tenerla legata al passato nella fede risuona l'eterno presente di Dio che trascende il tempo e tuttavia può essere accolto da noi solamente nel nostro irrepetibile oggi. Perciò ritengo che la cosa più importante ravvivare in tutta la Chiesa quella positiva tensione, quell'anelito a riannunciare Cristo all'uomo contemporaneo. In 1964, Pope Paul VI became the first pontiff to make an international pilgrimage of peace to the Holy Land. Shortly after, he would travel to India and in 1965 would visit New York City to meet with the United Nations and attend the World's Fair. In a truly missionary spirit, Pope Paul brought Michelangelo's Pietà to the Vatican Pavilion, where thousands of people from all walks of life could encounter this inspiring sacred sculpture. Pope Paul also celebrated an unforgettable mass at Yankee Stadium, drawing tens of thousands from the heart of the city to the Eucharistic table together. Today, the Synod of Bishops for the New Evangelization gathers in Rome to discuss new ways to share the Christian message. But what does the New Evangelization precisely mean? It means different things in different parts of the world. And so right now we're trying to come up with a working definition and I'm not sure that there can be one definition that describes it for every part of the world. Certainly in the Arab world, in other, where there's many different religions, what is the new evangelization and what is the first evangelization that needs to take place too? So it's a real interesting dynamic and, and uh, dialectic that's coming together at this synod. We're in a new situation. Uh, the forces are often called secularizing forces. They're very strong on us. And so people who have been baptized even perhaps catechized as young people, they can find their faith uh, very much under pressure. It, it's very important, of course, that we don't try to re-evangelize by taking the cross out of Christianity. Uh, to come to the resurrection, you have to have the redemption and you have to have crucifixion Christianity. And that's always the temptation when we're trying to make things modern, is that we make them less than what Christ asked us to, to do. Well, I think to misinterpret the new evangelization, people would first have to know what in the world it actually means. And, you know, to this day, I'm not sure we actually have a 100% crystal clear definition of what's new about the new evangelization. But, you know, look, I mean, in broad strokes, of course, it means reviving the missionary energies of the, of the church. And in a particular way, I think, in the West, meaning Europe and, and North America, in traditionally Christian cultures, where in some ways the church has had a fairly bad run, uh, you know, in recent decades. And, you know, the inroads of secularization have meant, you know, declining mass attendance, declining vocations of the priesthood and religious life, and a certain sort of widespread sense of ennui, uh, I guess, you know, we could say. And then the new evangelization is meant to sort of turn that frown upside down. So when we talk about the new evangelization, we're not talking about a new program. We're not talking about a new activity, uh, another thing to do but rather we're talking about a new attitude, developing and cultivating a new attitude, a new disposition, a new way of seeing the reality of the church, the new way of believing. Conversion is the call of the Holy Spirit, a response of the heart, and we must come to have a deeper friendship, relationship with Christ. We need to know who He is and why does His teaching matter to us. Uh, and I believe that once we can come to that level of conviction and strong faith, uh, we're certainly going to be much more eager to share that with other people.
To take part in the new evangelization, it is important to first understand that interior conversion that must take place. You know, some would say, would read the new evangelization uh, as an attempt to say, well, look, the season of internal reform in the church is over. All of our problems have been solved, uh, you know, and now we're ready to, to take our message to the outside world. Well, I mean, if that's what you think the new evangelization means, I can tell you for sure that's not how Benedict XVI understands it, because nobody is a more clear-eyed realist. Uh, about both the, the, the shadows and the light uh, in the life of the church uh, than Benedict XVI. I mean, nobody takes a more unflinching look uh, at the various ways in which, in which the church is always in need of reform. Instead, I think he would look at it this way, that the energy to successfully cope with those very real and urgent problems in Catholic life, the energy to do that successfully is going to come from relighting our missionary fires because ultimately that's going to focus our eyes on the real prize here and the real prize is to bring Christ to the world. Now if there are deficiencies in Catholic life that get in the way of doing that, we need to solve them. But not because we're like bureaucrats who get off on moving the levers of power, it's because we're evangelists who want to make the church a more credible instrument for transforming the secular world from the inside out in the light of Christ. Traditionally, priests, religious, clergy, catechists, and foreign field volunteers had all taken on the role of missionaries. But through Ad Gentis, the bishops of Vatican II expanded this mission to all of the faithful. The Pilgrim Church is missionary by her very nature, since it is from the mission of the Son and the mission of the Holy Spirit that she draws her origin in accordance with the decree of God the Father. The goal of the faithful in foreign missions is to listen and respond in love through mutual dialogue centered on communication and the universality of God. Like Christ, who subjected himself to particular social customs and practices, and who in the Incarnation became man, missionaries are never called to eradicate cultural heritage, but to integrate, teaching and transforming the hearts of those they minister to. Lord, we pray for all the Christians who are living in countries at war. May they be comforted. Just outside of St. Peter's Square, a small stone church is home to the Centro San Lorenzo, the official youth center of the Vatican. So the idea for Centro San Lorenzo started 30 years ago in 1983. Young people from Germany came to, to Rome. They said, uh, oh, we've seen uh, beautiful buildings, we've seen uh, ancient stones uh, and uh, that's all good but we uh, haven't met uh, really um, living stones of the church. We haven't met young people uh, with whom we could uh, share our faith. Pope John Paul II decided to open a youth center here in Rome to welcome the pilgrims and he felt it was important to have a special place to welcome them well. So uh, simply they started to search for a place in Rome where uh, young pilgrims um, and young students could be welcomed in Rome and they, they found uh, this church in which we stand right now. It's something that you can't see uh, in the city or anywhere else, uh, even in, in other cities, you know. Um, here you can come and meet people from, um, I don't know, Kazakhstan, <laughs> America, Asia everything and you feel this linked with them because they are also coming here to meet Jesus. In every celebration we have people coming from different nations, different languages. We try to help one another and never we have a problem because uh, we can have one translation from English to French to Italian to Spanish to Portuguese and, um, and find the best way. Uh, with a great charity we can do so many, so many things. Kevin Wagner is the director of the Emanuel School of Mission in Rome, the organization which helps run the Centro San Lorenzo while teaching young people how to evangelize in the modern world. The Emanuel School of Mission in Rome is one of four Emanuel Schools of Mission. The four schools all have a common thread, and that common thread is to train, uh, train young missionaries from all around the world so that they can be missionary in their own place. And so the, each of the schools has their own particular charism. But here in Rome, the charism is really to be close to, to the Pope, close to the heart of the church. And so the students come here from all around the world uh, in order to become 
more fully who they're created to be. We uh, have mission here in Rome uh, and also abroad. This year we'll be in Lithuania and in Belgium, Flemish part of Belgium. This is a great opportunity to evangelise in the streets and tell the streets of my love for Christ and for his church um, to everyone. I want to root my faith completely in Christ, to experience life in a very special and a different way, and also to, to get answers from all my questions, to learn more about my faith, and also to learn to be a missionary, to evangelize back in my country or wherever I am, to be a walking missionary every day, to, so that people will know Christ. I realized that actually I don't know anything about Catholic Church. I know a little bit about catechesis and it was my idea to study as missionary and therefore I come to ESM. Yeah. You learn how to evangelize, how to uh, think positively, how to think as a Christian. You find yourself during the year and you, you get to meet the, the people from all, all around the world. So this is a great opportunity for a young person to, to come and to find himself. So many young people are sad, are depressed because difficulties in their family, in their studies, in their job, in their life, affective life and so on. And so uh, the fact to, to find uh, young people at them who have a special joy attract a lot, attract a lot. Uh, Pope Benedict during the last year, in 2012, sent a message to the young people saying that, that we can evangelize by joy. The purpose, I think, why young, I mean, what young people are searching in their life is the meaning of life. Why are they here? What's the purpose? And who is God? I mean, everybody has questions, who is God? And also to, yeah, to just seek. Well, in Australia, there's definitely a, there's a spirit of indifference. Um, you know, you can go to church if you want. I don't really want to. And unfortunately, that's also prevalent in the, um, within young Catholics as well. Everyone has their own opinion, let's just let them let them be, even if it's not right. Um, that's what they want to do, we'll, we'll let them be and we just do our own thing. And there's also this spirit of, um, uh, of unbelief as well, where people just aren't interested in church and they're not interested in God. In Lithuania it's 95% of Catholic people, but only uh, very, few percent, very few percent are uh, practicing. So um, for me, coming back to Lithuania with, with the, these news and everything new in myself would mean that I would come with a, like a, new, a new fire, a new flame to inflame other people. Uh, because uh, I think, I, I personally, the young people, they don't know uh, what is the church all about, what is the faith all about, and God is good, God is great, and people don't know that. And so basically how the young people react in my country towards Christianity, well, it's okay, it's peaceful, it's harmony. I have lots of friends from, who are Muslims, who are Hindu, Buddhist, non-believers, and of course Catholics, Christians and all. It doesn't matter whether they believe or not, they're a human being and they deserve uh, love and the love of Christ. Just um, go to them, listen to them, and um, show them that there is someone who is interested in you, someone who loves you, and um, that's the most important part. Pope Benedict, you say that we have to, to make this experience that the church is a place for friendship. Last year we went to, to prisons. There are uh, Bible chain uh, evenings also. We are having adoration and mass here every day. And I think it's really important because it means that um, all the students uh, who are here in Rome can come here to just be with Jesus uh, every day. I really feel to my experience that opening my heart to God helps me to open my God to other people, to other young people, to, to everybody. And then we have also uh, missions. So we take the cross and we go to Campo de Fiori. It's a, um, famous place in Rome where all the young people gather, you know, to um, during the night, and we go there and try to to talk about Jesus to to those young people who are gathered there. When uh, we were talking with people, some were very open, some 
were just indifferent. But I think that talking with them of God is just a way for them to maybe think about it and talk with their friend and uh, just to think that, yes, people believe, uh, people think that God is uh, alive, that he loves us. So actually here we, here we are, called to be missionaries um, of a new evangelization um, in the center of the church in Rome. Um, and uh, we can give really witness of uh, Christ's love for us. It's a great help for us. Uh, it's a World Youth Day Cross, which we host here in the church. And it was uh, given to the Centro from John Paul II in 1984. The World Youth Day Cross may have its home in the Centro San Lorenzo, but it will travel to Rio this year. It is a missionary symbol of new life that has been brought to places all over the world. We know that there's thousands and thousands of persons who touch it, who wanted to see it. I know a person who converts seeing this cross going in all different countries. It's also the symbol of the World Youth Day. And uh, then I'm happy also to, to go on this mission, to be close to this cross, uh, which is very a sign uh, of hope. We experience a great joy also about mission because the theme of the world is about missions. When Jean Paul II asked us to bring the cross in all different places, uh, he asked us also to bring the cross uh, in the place where there is suffering, uh, to bring hope, to bring consolation. And we had also the opportunity to go uh, in the United States, in New York, uh, in the place of the Twin, the twin Towers. I think that uh, most people think that the cross is actually a symbol of death. But for me, uh, uh, the, the symbol of the cross is actually the symbol of life. Because uh, our Lord Jesus Christ, he, he died but He resurrected. This is actually a symbol of resurrection for me. Well, why choose Jesus Christ is because of His pure love. I mean, there's, there's no other person I've I seen, have I read, have I heard who has as much love as him. I mean, to sacrifice himself, to die on a cross for us, who would do that? Only Jesus, yeah. Uh, the faith is a gift. It's a gift for everyone and it's selfish to keep it for our, on our own. And so uh, I feel that the, the mission of the school is the mission of the Second Vatican Council. It's the mission to, to become fully, more fully Christian, more fully human and to be a real witness to those people that we meet. And one of the things we really encourage of the students who come to the schools of mission is not necessarily to, to go and, and work for their church in a paid capacity, but to really go back to their schools, to their universities, to their jobs, to their families, and to be Christian there, to be a witness, to be a light to the world. During the Second Vatican Council, the bishops highlighted that missionary activity should be collaborative, ecumenical when possible, and devoid of prejudice and nationalistic ideas. Well, I would say if the West cannot learn something from the rest of the world in terms of how the church ought to comport itself in the 21st century, then we got real problems. Because the reality of Catholic life in the 21st century is that places like Mumbai and Jakarta and Manila are gonna be for us what Paris and Louvain and Milan were in the 15th and 16th centuries, the primary centers of new theological imagination, new pastoral models, new political leadership. And if we can't be part of that conversation, then I, I think you know, the, the risk is that the, the West in the church uh, is going to be ever further behind where the global conversation in the church actually stands. Now, in terms of what we can learn, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the new evangelization, that is, you know, how do you take the church's message into the street in a way that works? Uh, I think there's a great deal uh, to learn from Catholic cultures outside the West in terms of how to go about that. I think one compelling example would be Asia. During the Synod of Bishops on the new evangelization, I would tell you that the most effective listened to, talked about, mulled over speeches in the early part of the Synod came from the Asian bishops. Uh, guys like uh, Archbishop Luis Antonio Tagli in Manila, for example. Their argument was that for the church to be evangelizing the 21st century in their context, it means three things. 
First, the church must relearn humility because any pretense of, of arrogance or power or privilege is going to alienate the people you're trying to reach. Second, the church has to relearn simplicity, uh, and particularly simplicity of lifestyle, that, that religious leaders need to come off as people who are comfortable with simplicity and embracing the, 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 the poverty of the people they're trying to evangelize. Third, and perhaps most importantly, the church has to relearn silence, that, that, that we can't pretend that we've got prefab answers to all of life's problems because people are smart. You know, they know that reality is complex and, and, and simple banalities aren't going to cut a lot of ice you know, for people who are struggling with extremely difficult and extremely complicated circumstances in their lives. And sometimes the only thing you can deliver, but it's the most powerful thing of all, is the silent willingness to stand with them while they struggle. So that is sort of the Asian recipe for successful evangelization, humility, simplicity, and silence. Now the Asian bishops were talking about how that works in their cultural context, but I suspect a lot of people in the West would, would hear that and say, you know what, that's not a bad strategy for us too. In ancient times, Christians would go to where few others of the Roman Empire would go, to the sick and destitute to serve the least of their brethren. Since the early days of Christianity, wherever the church has brought its mission, the quality of life has often improved. The Pontifical Mission Societies are the church's organizations in the United States, commissioned by the Society for the Propagation of the Faith, offering services for pastoral and evangelization programs, catechetical work, church and chapel construction, healthcare, education, communications, and transportation needs, the Pontifical Mission Societies aid some 1,150 dioceses around the world. Theology and catechesis may be the heart of the new evangelization, but missionary activity often incorporates works of mercy along with education. The Marinelle Society is composed of priests, religious brothers and sisters, and lay volunteers serving both domestic and international missions. Their objective is to transform lives by living and working with the sick and poor, while growing in a community of faith together. Today, they are the largest Catholic missionary organization based in the United States. In 1965, the Council Fathers would issue their document on the missionary work of the Church, known as Agentis, and thus, finally, the intention of the Creator in creating man in his own image and likeness will be truly realized when all who possess human nature and have been regenerated in Christ through the Holy Spirit, gazing together on the glory of God, will be able to say, Our Father. Half a century ago, Vatican II planted new seeds for missionary work and evangelization. With the advent of color television and the continuing evolution of the press, the bishops recognized the great power and responsibility of social communications. How would the Council approach the use of mass media, and to what end? And how has the Council's work affected journalism and the entertainment world we know today? Tune in next time to Vatican II, Inside the Council.